it's so awesome to be back with you all. Um, David, Alex, and oh, my. Leah, um, for having me back. I, I gotta tell you, I, I took more away than I think I gave last time out in San Francisco. Um, what, what I, what I, as Dave was saying, my whole job is developing trust strategies with human beings. Uh, I, I still do work, I work counterintelligence with the FBI, but I'm not here as FBI, it's my day off. I'm, Total volunteer gig, I always got a copy out that. I thought some opinions represent myself alone and not as any government institution or organization. Um, <laughs> you gotta say it. Um, but when, well, so what I do on a daily basis is develop trust, and it really highlighted that to me. I was at Quantico teaching a class uh, a couple weeks ago, and I had a class of uh, about 30 agents out in the audience, and I said, to them, okay, so out of you 30, how many of you actually have subjects you know, that you're investigating actually have committed a crime. One hand went up. I said, all right. I said, so how many of you have confidential human sources, people that you're chatting with that are helping you out that have committed a crime? No hands went up. I said, all right, so why should any of these individuals want to talk to you and help you? There's no motivation. It really comes down to who you are and how you treat people. The other thing I found pretty fascinating with all this too is that it does not matter your title or position for anything you do or you want to achieve and who you are. It really comes down to how you treat human beings. You know, right now, I, I stepped down uh, sequestration, got rid of the position I had uh, last year, and I am literally a nothing in my organization. I got four years till retirement, and my entire purpose in life is to help everyone else achieve what they're trying to achieve. And I gotta tell you what peace that brings, but it's amazing because I do more speaking around the country now than I ever did before, because it's about how you treat people and how communicate effectively with people. Um, one of the biggest things I do right now, getting back to you know what I took away from last year, was um, one, I got a great understanding of the millennial generation, much more so than I ever had before. Because when you're trying to communicate, you're trying to build trust, one of the key elements you're trying to do is you're trying to understand context. How do you see me through your life and lens, through your optic, through your experience, through your demographic, your generation, your, your ethnicity? That's such a key critical part because you know, Natalie sees me different than, than Shane sees me, because you're from Canada, you're from the UK, you know, different contexts, different ages, different experiences, and so when you see me, each of you sees me very differently, even though I see myself as only one thing. If I'm trying to develop trust and rapport and influence with any human being, I have to take those things into account. I just can't barrel through those things. And so one of the things I, I, I've been asked to do in the last year um, where I worked down in Virginia is I do leadership training around the state for all law enforcement right now. And since my side job, but I do it a lot. And, and one of the greatest challenges that these guys have is these chiefs of the police, and, and this one guy said to me, he says, I cannot maintain my workforce. All these young cops that are coming on, all these millennials that are coming on, born 1985 and up, they're quitting within, you know, soon after they're hired because it, it was the most, it, it was a very judgmental statement he made, which is the key, which I'm gonna talk about here, is non-judgmental validation of human beings. It is absolutely the number one critical thing in life to do if you want to be successful with anyone. Non-judgmental validation. It's an easy thing to say, but it's very, very hard to do. And the more you practice that every single day of your life, that is what's going to make that difference. And so what was happening was he said to me, he said, these millennials, they don't form loyalty to the, to the job, to the organization, to the structure. He said, and actually, and he said, they just don't know how to form loyalties at all. And just being a lover of social psychology and evolutionary psychology, I said, well, you're not going to undo, you know, thousands of years of evolution in one generation. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't really accept that. I didn't say that because I'm judging him then. Um, but I actually went back that night and I did some research on this. And this was what was really fascinating and really eye-opening for me. And it made a lot of sense. And that's what it really comes down to is, is these moments of, of clarity and it not being complicated. How many millennials do we have in here by showing hands? 1985 now. I love it, most, most, um, which is what I take from this because everything I learned there, I brought to these guys. Um, and and it's, it's the way the millennials, where you all see the world in a different way than the other generations. And so what I found was that, yes, millennials do form loyalties. They form fierce loyalties. Is it the structures and organizations though? What's it too? Absolutely, who said people? Come to me after I have a for you. <laughs> Absolutely, it's people. It's 100% people. So what the challenge for these older generations for baby boomers and the answers is, is they, they thought that by giving you a job, you'd have loyalty because, and thankfulness just for the job. But they weren't taking time to mentor, guide, educate, 
and make you part of that team. So they were walking away, trying to find somewhere else. Now, why do you think that is? That is the people. What are some of the reasons? And this is this will this starts to get a little anecdotal, but this is from my own experience. I got two teenagers. I got two high schoolers. What? The economy, partly probably. The man. The what? The man. The man. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. What is your relationship to your parents compared to the other generations? What? It's our parents. It's our parents. Are you close? Do you think, and it's hard to, it's hard to tell because you're not from the other generation, do you think you're closer to your parents than the other generations? Yes. 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 I'll tell you what, my kids are my best friends. There's no doubt in my life. I'm, I'm clearly the parent. I'm the one in charge in the house. But they're my best friends. My son is literally my best friend. We do absolutely everything together. And he's 14 years old. When I grow up, I want to be like him. You know, and he just came to, and it's still true. He, you know, because he's asking me all these questions about, you know, what I do in developing trust, and he's exercising these things at school. He's, you know, he's going to the ninth grade. So I'm dumbfounded what he's doing. And if I knew this all, only 10 years ago, or what I would have done with my career. Um, and, I mean, and, and he, he even did this, and this was just so telling in an understanding of context of this generation. You know, he just had his eighth grade award ceremony, um, you know, where you go into high school and, and you get all your awards for all the great things you did, and he, he did really good. Um, and he wants to follow his dad's footsteps. That's very nice. Um, but he came home that night and he said, he, and all he did was sit on the couch and thank my wife and I profusely for all the help and guidance we gave him to allow him to achieve all he achieved. I mean, I, was, I, I, I could never in a million years imagine telling my parents that. <laughs> it's me, it's this guy did it. You know, but, so that's why millennials, it's, they form that loyalty and trust to individuals. And so that's, that's what I took away, and that was my awareness. And so I want to thank you all um, for that last time, because I'm sharing that in all my experiences here. See, you know, Leah's wondering, hey, you only had 10 slides, and, and you won't get, you, you know, all, I won't get through them all, I guarantee it, if I start telling these stories. <laughs> all right. Okay, see where I'm at. Okay, so here's our, I always have to have objectives um, to kind of have my roadmap. So I'm going to have all these, I see shiny things here and here, and I kind of get distracted. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Discuss and apply the core element of establishing trust and building relationships for any situation. Uh, last time in San Francisco, even if you weren't there, you go back and look at the video. I talked about five strategies for building trust. I'm gonna. Life is such an evolution, and I, I find new core elements every day just because of the way I'm living. And so I started out a couple years ago. I had my ten techniques for building quick rapport that Shane Parrish did a great job of highlighting for me in July. Um, and I then boiled it down to wow, I got these five things that really work well when strategizing relationships and strategizing trust. Now we talked about last time. And then I, I've had new epiphanies since then. Um, I, I got a great coworker um, who was struggling, had been struggling with her daughter, um, who was a teenager. And I, I would listen to the phraseology, because it really all comes down to phraseology. I never tell anyone to do anything. I never have advice or guidance for anyone. I ask questions. Because if you if I have clarity of what you're trying to accomplish, and I can ask you questions to help you understand what it is you're trying to accomplish and help you discover what the solutions are, are you more likely or less likely to take the action? More likely. And now I'm framing it according to what my goals and objectives are probably, but you're empowered to do those things because I'm never telling you what to do. I never use words should and shouldn't in my vocabulary. Because as soon as I say you should do something, what's your natural inclination? Yeah, shields are up. And so, I was listening to her phraseology when talking to her teenager who had been, she'd been really battling with her a lot. Um, matter of fact, they called cops a few times because she, uh, she was being beat by her. She was cutting herself, uh, the teenager was. It was a pretty serious situation. And every word out of her mouth during these dialogues was, she shouldn't be doing that. She's with the wrong guy. She shouldn't be doing this. And it's very judgmental. And all I would do is I said, you know, I'd say, you know, Karen, what about if you phrase it like this? You know, and I just start asking questions. And so what she started doing, I realized was she was judging every single action her daughter was doing. So if you're judging every action someone's doing, are your shields up or down? They're up. So why should someone change their behavior? These are simple questions. This why it's not complicated. Think about, all I try to do is I try to think of the cause and effect of every action and every word out of my mouth before I take that action. Because I think about my goal that I'm trying to achieve first. And then I think about, why should, it, why should you do that? Why should someone align with that goal and objective? And I got to think about context, I think about anything else. And so it really comes down to framing it so that you are coming up with that decision and I'm being totally non-judgmental and validating you for who you are as a human being. 
That's what genetic coding. We crave being accepted and validated as human beings because we want to be part of the tribe. And I talked about that last time too. We want to become part of the tribe because it's comfort for us. I mean, even when I, I mean, I think I did this last time. You know, who's ever traveled overseas? And Natalie probably feels right now. You know, and, and you know, Shane. You know, what happens when you find another American? <laughs> Latch on tight because it's comfort. You know, we're coded for this comfort, so we always want to be accepted and validated for who we are. So if you give that non-judgmentally to another human being and you don't judge anything about them, and I'm not saying you agree with them, there's a big difference between agreeing and not judging. Shields are coming down. So we're going to talk about that, because that is the core element. Next clip. And, and as, as always, identify that, which you already know. Everything I talk about, it, it, this is common sense, you already do it in your life. You know, how many of you have a significant other in some way? You're doing this successfully. You know, this I like just getting the labels and the meanings behind the social psychology and the neuroscience behind some of these things and why they're effective in your life already. So that you can choose to improve and increase the areas that you want to. And we all have things we're working on. My wife tells me all day we're all working on something. And if you realize that we're all working on something, you can help someone else with what they're working on and be tolerant of that because you're working on something too. And you can choose to increase your area that you're working on. You know, I'm a big believer that you can't change anyone. My genetics and biology is what it is. My experiences that I had, and you all have between the ages of 9 and 19, roughly during early developmental years, and give you your frame in the context that makes you you're your generation, you can't change those experiences. But you can add a lot to it through the rest of your life. I mean, look, look at my background. This is, it's crazy sick, you know, when it comes to what definition of a narcissistic megalomaniac jerk should be. You know, I'm an Able Academy graduate, former Marine Corps officer, FBI guy. That is type A in your face with a finger pointing at it. And I was. And it's just so ineffective. And each, you know, my job was to talk with people that should have no reason in earthly presence to ever want to talk to me. And if you want to be successful at that, you can't be that way. So this whole process, I didn't change who I am. That's still a little, it's reduced to about this size. I added everything that I'm talking about to everything I'm doing since then. And it's still an ongoing process. And probably the biggest thing for me in this last year was even greater humility. I have no position, and yet I'm still, it's all about the content. It's just about sharing the content. It's about sharing how to not judge another human being. I gotta tell you, when you're trying to do these things and trying to develop trust and influence in someone's life, and you realize the only way to truly do it, to start and be good at it, is to not judge another human being, you think that calms you or raises your anxiety? Calms you down. I gotta tell you, I, I was talking to David and, and Shane and Natalie before. There's no one in my life that bothers me. There's not one human being I interact with that bothers me whatsoever. It's because there's nothing there. I, I, I understand context. Even if I don't agree with the choices you're making, I don't, even, I don't even think of not agreeing with you. If I don't understand it, it's a better way I phrase it now, I then seek to find context. How is it you derived at that conclusion? Help me understand why you made those decisions. You don't think it's a bad decision, so I can understand why you don't think it's a bad decision. It's all about getting that context. And so it's just building upon what you already know, and it's really not complicated. Uh, I always got a, David always likes a big story. Um, this, is, this is my New York City, so I'm a New Yorker, so this is kind of fun being back in the city, but it brings back some of these fears. Um, so here I am, because it's about discovering a need. You know, at what point in your life, for me it's continual, did you realize that, wow, the world sees me differently than I think I see myself? And you know what? They just don't care. So here I am, I, I work down here at 26 Federal Plaza, uh, right down the street on Broadway. I had been in the I had been in New York as an agent, I think about two weeks. And remember, go back, former Marine, FBI guy, first time wearing a gun. I mean, it's all about this guy. And so do you think that goes well in New York? <laughs> I remember, uh, oh, oh, I got to see an old North story, so I'll keep on this one. So here I am, I get to my car. I got, it's, if you get in early enough in the morning, you can actually park somewhere near the office. And I got in early, I think I got in like 4.30, so I could be like a block away. Uh, uh, on, on, it's on Thomas Street, right at the intersection of Broadway and Church right there. And so I, I go to leave, go home at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. I get my car, my nice pure car, you know, I got my gun, my creds, you know, feeling, feeling, feeling really important. I get up to the intersection, and I don't know what it was, maybe the way I looked, maybe, who knows, just because, um, the bike messenger. These guys, New York, New York bike messengers, Ed, who's ever encountered them? 
they look, they're, they're, they're amazing, aren't they? I mean, they, these guys are miracle workers. They're carrying these boxes, that, so this guy's a big bulky guy. That they generally ride about a $5 bike with a $50 chain around it to, to protect that $5 bike. Anyway, this guy goes whisking in front of me, and he looks up at, well, looks down at me in my car, and he gives me the New York salute. And I look at him, I won't do it, you know, because we're on cameras right now, but he gives me that New York salute. <laughs> and I go, oh, yeah? Screw you, buddy, I'm an FBI guy. Showed him. So, light turns green, I go through the intersection, I look at my rearview mirror. He's coming. He wheeled around and he's chasing me down. And I, now, when you go through training, you know, you learn about the deadly force policy. And my training starts kicking in. If I threat, if I feel like my life or someone else's life is in threat or danger, you know, deadly force is authorized. And now I'm thinking, oh my god, what am I going to do? This guy's going to kill me. He, he was like, he's strapping like me, big 6'4 guy. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to do? You know, and he's chasing me. I'm coming up with another red light. And um, I, 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 I was imagining the Daily News the next day, you know, dumbass new agent kills bike messenger. Not good. Or it's going to be bike messenger kills dumbass new agent. Still not good. Um, so at that point, I decided to start blowing lights and run to the West Side Highway. <laughs> And I did, and I made it. And uh, from that point on, I never gave a New York salute again. And I realized my place in life. It's not that big. <laughs> so it's that context. It's, it's discovering that you're not nearly as important as you think you are. And if you just help build others up, you'll get in kind everything back. You know, it's like set your goals and objectives and priorities. Put them here. Because I, I, I always have a goal and objective. Every time I engage someone or something, I always have a goal. Because it keeps me on my path. But then from that point on, it's all about someone else's goals and priorities. And I make theirs my priorities, and I, and I go wholeheartedly to help them accomplish theirs. Because when you're doing that, what you're doing is, I've now sensitized myself to my goals and objectives. I mean, who's ever heard the old adage, you know, if you want something, you know, write it down, and it'll come to you. You know, it's, I call it the last time my Toyota Green Tundra effect, you know, where, you know, the day you bought your new car, you start recognizing new cars everywhere. You know, and, and so it's the same thing. So as, you, as long as you identify what it is you're trying to achieve, put it back here, what you're going to then do is if you make everyone else the priority of the people you're trying to take care of, you discover what their goals and objectives are, and you help them achieve them, and you don't judge them for who they are and the decisions they're making, your shields are down, and you will see and recognize opportunities to align those goals and priorities. Because it's natural. It will just happen because you've identified your, yours, you've sensitized yourself to yours, you now know theirs, and you're wholeheartedly trying to achieve theirs for them. So who want, why would they want to reciprocate in some way? Or at least line with yours, because their shields are completely down the entire time. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? It ain't complicated. So it, it, it's, it's, it's been the most easy thing to do after you learn how to get over yourself and your own ego. All right, so it really comes down to non judgmental validation. So when I recognize this to my friend Karen with what she's done with her daughter, um, we just worked on that phraseology, ask questions. And, and it, as a parent, it's, it's difficult. Because you know you have toddlers, and, and when you have little kids and, and they're growing up, you you have to tell them what to do for their own safety, and so they can learn the difference between right and wrong from your context. Because you know I don't believe there's actually right and wrong; there just is. And so, but you're, you're teaching them your 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 ethics, your morals, and all that. But at a certain point, they reach an age where they are cognating as a young adult, and you kind of stop telling them what to do. And that's where that struggle between the parents and the children starts taking place. And so it's at that point where I stop telling my kids what to do. There's rules, and if, they, if they, something happens where they are, go against the rule in the house, I ask questions. First thing I do, and I don't judge their friends, I don't judge anything that's going on in their life, I ask questions about it. And the, the flow of information is amazing, sometimes a little too much. Um, but this is, this is the key, is just asking those questions non-judgmentally. Because what happened with Karen's daughter is massive turnaround. Her daughter now snuggles with her on the couch, and you form a little nest with your legs watching TV, uh, sharing everything with her. And even when you know her daughter got back together with a boy that she thought was a horrible influence in her life, Karen did not judge that decision. She asked questions about it. And, and, uh, but luckily, she said about a week ago, she broke up with him, so she started doing a little cheer anyway. And, but she did cheer in front of her. Because would that have been judgmental? Yes. This is, this, if you can hold yourself from judging verbally, non-verbally, thoughts, words, and actions, this is the key that I've found in my life. I've, I've gotten from the 10 to the 5 to the 1. It's this one thing. It's the key element of everything I do. And it's because it goes back to our neuroscience as a human being. You know, it, our brain rewards us when we're you know, self-validating, talking about our own priorities and interests, and not being judged for them. 
so my recent example of this is, uh, I got them every day. Um, a really powerful one I thought was uh, dealing with, uh, my daughter had a, a thing at school where um, she's a sophomore, now she's a junior, and I don't know, she's probably going to kill me for telling the story too. <laughs> so she applied to the National Honor Society. And um, she's extremely smart, she's a varsity athlete, she's got all these things going on, um, very well in her life, and I thought, what a great opportunity to not be the helicopter parent anymore. Part of this process, for, see now, when I went to school uh, just north of here in Putnam County, when you wanted to get on National Honor Society back in the Stone Ages, what you did was this. You had good grades and you raised your hand and you're on National Honor Society. All of you out there, is that how National Honor Society works anymore? No, no. It's a lot of work and you got to document things and this and this and this and it's a, it's a struggle. And so she had done all that and then came down to the application process. In the application process, they said, the students should fill this out themselves. And I was like, hey, here's a great opportunity for her for the first time to step out, fill out herself and be responsible for her actions. Because, you know, the I'm trying to do that, keep her out the door a little bit. Well, she did. And she denied getting on the National Arts Society. And it was because they gave no samples, no rubric, nothing to help her out do this. And I failed her as a parent by actually guiding her a little bit more on this. And so uh, I married Mrs. Claus, and I say that because she's like the most generous, easygoing, you know, all these things I talk about is my wife and broken down. And except in this one instance, and you start messing with her kids. And so when she didn't get a National Honor Society, I mean, she's ranked 12th in her class. She's got all these things going on, and she didn't get on. My wife goes, bam, ballistic. And she wants to start firing emails to the principal. There's an appeals process we found out about. And what she did was, and she did a great job, she found out all the things that were wrong in the process. There was no sample given out, no pony. There was no training that was given to the students or the parents. There was no grading rubric to show you the weight and the importance of this. None of these things were done that all the other sports and activities had. Is that correct? I mean, would you say that's something that would have been good to be in there? Yes. Yes, but there wasn't. Now, where is the, where's the other fault line? Me? Us. We failed to oversight and supervise this. But they're wrong. So our natural reaction as human beings is we're told we're not accepted. So what do we do? We poke. We want to poke and fire. We want to point out what everyone else is doing wrong. Correct? That's our natural inclination. That's what you have to spend. How long? Five? Yes, I do. All right, I can get it done in five. I'm on like, what, slide four? I don't know if you got that one. <laughs> and so what happens was, is that, you know, we, in my house, what happens is if you send an email, before you send an email, it goes through me. And all we have to do is work on phraseology so that we're not poking anyone. But we start out with validation, validation of how they are, validation of all the great things that they are as human beings and what they're doing for the school and everything else. So the shields are down. Then we ask questions, we seek advice and guidance, because when everyone has advice and guidance, everyone has thoughts and opinions, and when you have it, your brain's releasing dopamine, oxytocin, bloodstream, serotonin, all these things our bodies is telling us is good thus for us to do, is someone is seeking our advice and opinions, and then that's when you say, and did you also think of this? You know, so this is my, this is my standard thing that I try to do in communicating in any type of situation. So I told my wife, I said, we cannot be firing rounds downfield because we do not know the impact. I said, what's our goal and objective? Because this is the first thing you always gotta do. She said, get Caitlin in the National Honor Society. I said, what's, what's more important than that? Her future opportunities. That's what her goal and objective is. And so what we did was, you know, we grabbed these emails, and so when we went to talk to the principal, the great thing was, was that first words out of his mouth were, thank you for handling this with such grace. I have three other appeals, and just thank you for handling this with such grace. Because we were not poking. And instead of highlighting all the things that we thought he did wrong, or the schools was such a prostrate they did wrong, it was a strategy, and my wife just said, you're right, you do all the talking. I went in and I apologized. I had my daughter in there, and I, and I, I saw, and he's got a 16-year-old daughter in school, I said, you know, I, I'm hoping you can help me. I said, I feel really embarrassed. I said, I failed my daughter as a father. I said, what, what advice and guidance do you have for me? Because I feel like because of my fault, my lack of oversight as a parent, I have ruined her chances for future opportunities, for scholarships, getting the college she wants, all because of me and my fault. How can you help me? You think that has a different reaction than saying what they did wrong? Absolutely. Yeah, and so what this solution was very, it was, it was fantastic. Have trust that people will help you come up with great solutions if you're engaging in this way. And so he's, 
He said, this is my Caitlin Dream folder. I'm going to hold it for the rest of her career here. I guarantee you I'm going to write her the best recommendations that I can. And I'm personally going to fight to get her any scholarship she can get and in any school she wants to get to. And he went through how National Honor Society won't play nearly as much into what we think it does and how this, what he's the solution is, be better. He had to back his teacher. That's his goal and objective and priority. He had to take care of all his, his faculty, his status, you know, all these things. And so I understood his priorities and I aligned right with this. It's really simple. Don't poke. Because you will not change the behavior when doing that. Set your goals and objectives. I'll quickly go through this. I call it leaps. I have I, I get these great people reach out with all these great ideas for me after they read my stuff. And this guy, this is a political campaign guy. He wrote some of my stuff. He came up with Zachary and leaps. So, so learn about their parties, goals, and objectives. That's what I always do. I always try to find out what someone else is trying to do, their life, dreams, aspirations. Suspend your ego and validate the non-judgmentally for who they are. Allow them to talk. Suspend your own need to talk. This is very difficult. You know. Uh, Shane was doing a great job of letting me talk about myself a while ago. It feels good, you know, to be validated, you know, for all the things you think you're doing well in life. But suspend that need, bounce it back, and place their needs, wants, dreams, and aspirations ahead of yours. You have your set. Find out theirs. Make it their, your goal and check to take care of them, and then seek their thoughts and opinions along the way. Again, all these things are rewarding their brain for that engagement with you. Because at the end of the day, ultimately, my goal always is to leave another human being feeling better for having met me. Always, 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 always. That's Shenandoah Valley where I live, by the way. <laughs> so I help people discover what it is they want, then I help them achieve it. Pretty simple. This is my principles in life. That's it. Help them discover what they want. A lot of times people have no idea what it is they're trying to achieve. They run around in circles spinning. They have no idea. I just kind of sit back with clarity and ask questions. Well, what are you trying to achieve here? What are your goals? I want money. Yeah, well, okay, well, what do you want with money for? What's going on in your life that you need that? You know, and generally what I found is the underlying thing that people want in life, what do you think it is? Happiness. Yes, happiness. Finding what makes you happy, that's the challenge. Happiness and peace, happiness and peace in your life. And so I had to ask questions, well, how, is these, how are these relationships helping you with happiness? How are these relationships helping you with peace? How is this conversation dialogue? You don't have to be, I said the thing I said the last time, you don't have to be collateral damage in someone else's insecurities. If they're not bringing that kind of peace to you, just don't accept their words. And you have to be, it's not even being malicious, because I'm not judging it. That's just where they are. Let it be. If that's not who you are, then you don't have to accept those words. Being better for having met you. Always manage expectations. Everyone's on a path and a journey. Some people are sprinting down it, some people are stuck. If some people stuck in their path, don't worry about it. That's what they are doing. Be willing and able to help wholeheartedly if, if they want to have help and assistance on their path. If not, it's okay. Answer your expectations with it. Not everyone's ready to accept the grace gift on the planet, and that is non judgmental validation. Bam! <laughs> <laughs> Quickly.